the Woodrow Wilson Center and a major supporter of the Gildenhorn Institute of Israel Studies at the University of Maryland and College Park. Uh, both institutions have partnered together to produce today's panel discussion entitled Religion in the <clears throat> and the Israel-Palestinian Conflict. It's really the last segment <clears throat> of a very, very successful uh, international conference which commenced yesterday at the University of Maryland at College Park, arranged by our distinguished and uh, terrific uh, director, Yoram Perry. Uh, <clears throat> I attended most of the sessions yesterday, and it was just very well done. And I've heard a lot of comments from people who, uh, who were there yesterday and are here today. And um, lots of interesting subjects were discussed, and by very brilliant uh, panelists, including our distinguished panelists, uh, Ms. Tamir, Speaker of the uh, Knesset. Uh, so thank you all for coming. Let me also give a special thanks to the Van Leer Institute in Jerusalem, who has participated in, the, in, in uh, this conference and uh, very important participation. So thank you. Uh, we have representatives from the Van Leer uh, Center. Thank you so much. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the Woodrow Wilson Center, it was established by an act of Congress in 1968 as our nation's official living memorial to President Wilson. It was founded to honor and build upon Wilson's legacy as the man who bridged the divide between scholarship and public policy. The Institute of Israel Studies, as part of the University of Maryland College Park, studies Israel as a viable contemporary country, as it plays a major role in key policy, policy issues involving the Middle East. It will focus on Israel's history, its leaders, and politics, and its socioeconomic structure, and its pioneering work in the sciences and technology. The Institute, uh, being located near Washington, is di ideally positioned to bring Israel to the international forefront of key policy debates and dialogues concerning the Middle East, and to play a key role in enhancing the understanding of Israel's society for future generations. We are particularly pleased to have as the new director of the Institute of Israel Studies, Dr. Yoram Perry, from Israel, who is already a well-known personage in Washington. Dr. Perry, who has also been awarded the K Chair in Israel Studies at the university, was a close friend and political advisor to the late Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. And I can say that Alma and I were also very close to Yitzhak and Leah. Uh, Dr. Perry was former, <coughs> former editor-in-chief of the Israeli daily newspaper Devar and was the founder and director of the Herzog Institute for Media, Politics, and Society at Tel Aviv University. He has published five books dealing with Israeli military politics and the media, as well as dozens of academic articles and op-eds in various important journals and newspapers. Dr. Perry was a visiting senior scholar at the U.S. Institute of Peace. I think you're still a scholar there. Uh, where he finished his most recent and highly acclaimed book entitled Generals in the Cabinet Room, How the Military Influences Israel Politics. The book received the Best of the Best Award from the American Association of Academic Publishers and recognition from the Association of Public Libraries. In the very few months that uh, Yoram Perry has been director of the Israel Studies Program, he has substantially increased the number of courses <coughs> concerning Israel at the university and the number of students taking them, now totaling over 300 students. We are very pleased to have Yoram as our director. I am now pleased to turn the conference over to Dr. Robert Litwack, Vice President for Programs and Director of International Security Studies at the Woodrow Wilson International Center, who will introduce the panelists and moderate the session. Rob? Thank you very much, Joe. And let me add my voice of welcome to all of you to the Woodrow Wilson Center today. Uh, today's meeting is jointly uh, sponsored by the uh, Middle East program of the Wilson Center, which conducts the Joseph and Alma Gildenhorn Middle East Forum, of which this is part. And we're particularly pleased to be partnering with uh, the new uh, Institute of Israel Studies at uh, the University of Maryland, directed by Yoram Perry. We thank Joe Gildenhorn, uh, our board chairman, for his uh, uh, leadership uh, role uh, at this institution in, in promoting Middle East studies. And we thank Yoram for uh, the uh, collaboration with his uh, new institute, and we congratulate them on the, on the launching of that. Uh, today's topic, 
uh, could not be more timely. Uh, uh, and it's a broad one, uh, religion and the Israel-Palestinian uh, pa conflict. Oh, I just wanted to add that uh, I'm in the chair today because uh, my colleague, uh, the director of the Middle East program, Hala Esfandiari, is out of town. But uh, she sends regards and is, is, is uh, unfortunately not able to be with us today. Uh, the topic um, is a broad one, and we have a, uh, a range of perspectives uh, uh, to address it. Um, uh, all distinguished experts in the field. Our first speaker will be uh, Yuli Tamir, who's been a member of the Knesset from the Labor Party since 2003. Uh, she served as the Israel Minister of Education of, and of Immigrant Absorption. Um, she's currently the Deputy Speaker of the, of the Knesset. Uh, on, they're on a, on a parliamentary break right now, so she's able to be in America. Uh, she's been a lecturer in philosophy at Tel Aviv University. She's held research fellowships at uh, major institutions. And uh, of pertinence to this discussion, uh, uh, she's uh, one of the founders of the Peace Now movement in, in Israel. Uh, she will be followed by uh, Shibli Talhami, who is the Anwar Sadat Professor for Peace and Development at the University of Maryland, College Park. He's a non-resident senior fellow at the, Sadat, at the Saban Center at the Brookings Institution. He's the author of numerous works on international theory as well as on American Middle East policy. Uh, his most recent book, which will be out uh, later this month, is the Sadat Lectures, published by the U.S. Institute of Peace Press. Uh, he's a frequent media commentator and consultant uh, and much of his work, uh, current work, involves Middle East opinion surveys. And finally, we'll uh, turn to Edward Litvak, uh, who's a senior associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington. Uh, his work on strategy and other subjects have been translated into numerous languages and are standard works in the, in the field. Uh, his most recent book is The Grand Strategy of the Byzantine Empire, and I imagine there will be some way uh, from this topic to hook into that. Um, he's also served as a consultant for a number of governmental agencies and private companies. So uh, with that brief uh, introduction of our distinguished panel, let me turn to our first speaker, Yuli Tamir. Each of them will speak for about 15 minutes, then we'll have plenty of time to open it up for comments and questions from the floor. Can I speak from here or no, I'm asking the, actually the audience, but I don't know if people in the back can see me if I'm sitting here. Good, good. Okay. It's always the people in the back if you can come. Okay, good morning. Um, I'm very glad to be here today. Uh, so I'm uh, afraid this is not a discussion that will lead to happy um, conclusions. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict uh, is certainly a conflict that could be dealt with um, on two different, though somehow related layers, the political and the religious layer. It, I think it is common wisdom that as long as we are having a political dialogue with the Palestinians, and I should be saying that we have been dealing uh, for many years with different alternatives to um, solving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and all through these negotiations, at least from my point of view, it was quite clear that the pragmatic solution to the conflict could be found. It won't be an ideal solution. Nobody will be probably totally satisfied with it, but it will be a solution that is livable for both communities and will produce the two-state solution. Now that sounds a bit trivial. Um, I do remember the days, I think there are other people in the room who remember these days when we started talking about the two-state solutions, and that sound as a very radical thing to say. Actually, I do remember in the early 80s a debate in Israel, Yoram will probably remember that, whether we should say a Palestinian state or a Palestinian entity, because people said a state is too much, let's say an entity. But I think we have gone a long way, and the Palestinians have gone a long way, and the two-state solution now is a solution that could be dealt with in pragmatic terms. Now, those of you who were in the conference yesterday will acknowledge that what I say today is very much in line of what I said yesterday, that when you come to deal with the most difficult issues of the conflict, if you take a pragmatic view, you can 
put together a solution if you take a more declarative, um, visionary view, you run into disagreements very, very, very fast. Here is one example that I think is indicative and important. The right of return. If you deal with the right of return on the theoretical level, and you write an essay whether the Palestinians have a right of return, or whether the Palestinians and the Jews have their right of return, or whether the Palestinians should give up the right of return. At the end of the day, you reach a disagreement. I can tell you right now, and I think with a high degree of um, confidence, that the Palestinians will not give up the right of return. I can also tell you that Israel will not accept the right of return. So that seems to be a dead end, but it isn't. For those of you who follow the Geneva p papers, and I was part of Geneva as well, and some other people here that were part of Geneva, um, when it came to the point of dealing with the refugee issue, people said, okay, let's forget the declarations. Let's stick to the solution on the ground. What would we like to allow? What are the Palestinians demanding? And we came close. It's not an agreement yet, but I think we can agree. Jerusalem. If you stick to the theoretical question of whether Jerusalem should be united Certainly, I'm not talking about the religious aspect of it. I'll do it in a moment. But just to the, is Jerusalem the eternal capital of Israel? Is Jerusalem the eternal capital of the Palestinian? Is Jerusalem and Al-Quds the same thing, yes or no? Forget about it. If you ask, what will be the arrangement that they allow people to cross from East Jerusalem to West Jerusalem in order to live together, you'll find a solution. You can even have a map, and if you'll go, I don't want to advocate Geneva too much, but if you go to the Geneva site now, you can see the real maps of how you can build a road that will connect the two cities and divide them at the same time. So what I'm telling you is when you come with a pragmatic mind to the conflict, you can find solutions. Turning the Palestinian-Israeli conflict into a religious conflict means that you exchange a pragmatic political language with an existential language. An existential language will lead to an ongoing conflict that is getting out of control, and that is what we are witnessing today. Uh, my greatest fear is that what happens now in Jerusalem, in Hebron, for, by the way, ridiculous reasons, I, I have this uh, view that one should fight only important fights. Life is too short to fight insignificant fights. What happens now is that the Israeli government is fighting on 20 houses in East Jerusalem. Do you think that will really change the demographic balance? Or an apartment house here or there? Or even this grandiose plan of the prime minister that uh, we should have what he now calls national heritage sites, which is fine. I mean, Washington is full of national heritage sites, and this is a nice thing. But if you have a little bit of an ability to predict what will happen next, then you know that if you declare national sites in Israel, the <coughs> question will be, what about those sites that are over the green line? If you say no, it seems as if you've given up on these territories. If you say yes, it seems like you are annexing these territories. So why do you want to raise this discussion at all? But it's on the table, and what is happening now in Hebron, since the prime minister gave in to, by the way, he didn't intend to. To begin with, I must say, he was very careful, and none of the sites was over the green line. But then there was public pressure, and he included Merata uh, Machpela and the, the tomb of Rachel, and now we're seeing riots in Hebron that are uh, an expression of the uh, feeling of people in Hebron that this is a way of re or, or changing or restructuring the balance of power in Me'arata uh, Machpila. And unfortunately and irresponsibly, it was done, by the way, on the 25th of February. For those of you who remember, this was the day of the Goldstein uh, you know, event, event in, in Me'arat HaMachpelah. So put all this together, and you'll see how we're moving. 
from a pragmatic debate, which is difficult in itself, to a religious debate. Now, obviously, there are enough people around, not within the Palestinian ter- or not only within the Palestinian territories, but in the Middle East, that are looking at this as an opportunity to intervene in the conflict. Because if it is a religious conflict, then it's not an Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's a Muslim conflict. Put Jerusalem on the table, put the mosque on the table, and you will expropriate the debate from the hands of the Palestinians and make it an Arab or Islamic debate. Now, that's the last thing we need. That's the last thing that the United States needs, and that is irresolvable. You can't resolve the religious issue. Probably you shouldn't. At the end of the day, we, if we can live together, Israelis and Palestinians, by the way, if you were in the conference yesterday, you will know that we said the same thing about if we can live together, different kind of Jews, right? Don't ask the existential question. You know, let each one believe what they want to believe. Ask what you can do in order to reduce the tensions. Now, from my point of view, this is the one thing that the international community should be doing right now in order to prevent an escalation that then will not be reversible. I want to remind you how the last intifada started. Nobody intended an intifada. Nobody wanted it to happen. But there was the opening of the tunnel underneath the whaling wall, and then there were riots, and then people were killed, and then it went out of hand. The first thing to do right now is to try and calm the situation down. If the proximity talks will start, and I hope they will start, the first thing that should be discussed is how to create a new balance and a new kind of dialogue that puts aside all the religious and all the existential issues. My advice to the Prime Minister, who I respect, but unfortunately uh, we don't share the same views, uh, was to keep three debates very quiet and deal with them when the moment comes on very pragmatic terms. One is the issue of the refugees, the second is the issue of Jerusalem, and the third is the issue of Israel as a Jewish state. In all three issues, the only position that could lead to a solution is the following. When it will, the point will come, and we will have to discuss these issues, we will discuss them honestly and pragmatically. Now, unfortunately, we are now on the level of declaration. Everybody's making declarations, um, and I am afraid that this is going to last for a while. So if we look at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, by the way, if we look at other conflicts around the world, we know that religion is not uh, going to make them any easier to solve. And we know that religious leaders, unfortunately, despite what we all think they ought to be doing, are actually quite often steering uh, the debate and the disagreement, and we should not be put captive in the hands of the religious leaders on both sides, that they will determine for us the language we're using and our political flexibilities. And that is exactly what is happening right now. And from my point of view, um, it doesn't sound very promising. Thank you. Thank you, Yuli. Uh, Shibli Talhami. Thank you very much. It's really an honor for me to be here. Um, uh, I thank uh, Joan Alma Gildenhorn for supporting the University of Maryland and also supporting this institution, two, two institutions I care deeply about and with which have been associated. I also welcome Joram Perry as a colleague at the University of Maryland. It's a, it's a, a very important move for us and uh, look forward to working with you uh, over the coming years. Um, what I'd like to do is make a few uh, remarks clarifying some of the issues on the table that pertain to the relationship between religion and the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. I'm going to start with something uh, straightforward, which is that religion is neither the cause of this conflict nor, in my judgment, the primary barrier to the absence of a resolution. And, and up to here, 
uh, I think uh, uh, we, we may agree. Uh, I do believe that we, we could move in a direction that Yuli talked about of it really turning into religious conflict, in which case it would be very bloody. But let's face it, if the two-state solution falls apart in, in the foreseeable future, and I'm talking about the next three, four years, it wouldn't matter whether the conflict is going to be religious or secular, it's going to be bloody. And so uh, the bottom line is the, the barrier to, to, to a solution isn't really so much a function of this of, of religion. I'm going to talk about what happened uh, over the, the past decade in particular with the rise uh, of, of the sort of things that Yuli talked about that are important, which is the infusion of religion into politics in a bigger fashion, both on the Palestinian side and the Israeli side, in a matter that has changed the discourse and perhaps even the narrative of the conflict. And that does have the potential of uh, danger down the road. Uh, I don't think it has happened yet. Um, uh, I believe that if you look at the, I'm not going to review the history of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, but certainly this is primarily a conflict about modern sovereignty and territorial control and nationalism, much more than it is about religion. It, religion has always been important for Palestinians and Jews, for many of them, uh, and I don't think there's anything much new about that. But I think the extent to which religion has been the driving force in the way this conflict has evolved uh, is not as high as some people think. And if you look at the inception of the Zionist movement, or for that matter, the inception of the Palestine national movement uh, throughout its, uh, from, from uh, Arab nationalism into a, a Palestinian nationalism, it's been largely secular. And even with the rise of religious discourse uh, on both sides, the, the Israeli side and the Palestinian side, I think that discourse um, has been religious nationalist discourse, not religious discourse. And it's very important to keep that in mind. Even Hamas, I think, is not a globalist, jihadist, transnational organization. It's a Palestinian Islamist organization. And I think if it weren't a Palestinian nationalist uh, or, uh, Islamist organization, it would be rejected by many of its supporters. It cannot afford to be a globalist jihadist organizations because that's not where the Palestinian public is. It's still focused largely on the nationalist aspect of uh, uh, it, it defining the conflict. And I think to a large extent, even in Israel with the rise of the religious right, it percentage-wise, you still had the, a majority supporting a two-state solution, even in some instances among those people who support the religious right. So I, I think the, 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 the conflict has not been transformed. It, it is in danger of being transformed. It has not been transformed. And much of what happened over the past year has been less, as some people have suggested, a function of demographic and sociological change, meaning that more and more people have been drawn to religion uh, or we've had the, the demographic changes in Israel. Certainly these were factors. But I would submit to you uh, that that in, uh, rise in the importance of religion in both places was actually a function, direct function of politics, not of sociological change. And the two most critical events uh, were the collapse of Camp David in 2000 and 9-11. Yes, 9-11. And I think a lot of people underestimate uh, uh, you know, why, why that is important for this changing discourse. And, and I think that to a large extent, the very secular elites that are complaining right now about the rise of uh, religious nationalism have contributed to it, not merely by the failure to deliver, which has obviously empowered uh, more religious forces, but by virtue of actually adopting religious language themselves or religious symbols themselves or religious instruments themselves when their backs were against the wall in that conflict. And I think if you look at uh, uh, 2000 as the, the collapse of Camp David and the rise of the, uh, the Second Intifada and what, how each side saw it, uh, on the Palestinian side, it was seen as an existential threat, the way uh, the, the collapse of the peace uh, option um, was seen as an existential threat by the secular nationalists. And certainly the, the suicide bombings uh, were seen by the Israelis as an existential threat. They were defined that way. Um, and in, in some ways, both sought to mobilize broader support. Uh, uh, I, going back to 1991, 1992, after the first uh, Iraq war, 
Um, I visited Tunis with a, 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 um, a group of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences that was mediating, and I, uh, I asked uh, uh, then President uh, uh, Chairman Yasser Arafat uh, uh, whether he didn't feel that his hand was entirely weakened now because he lost the, the, the Iraq War and his siding with Saddam has meant that Arab uh, Gulf states are no longer going to support him. Uh, that he's losing ground, he's away in Tunis, uh, Hamas is rising in, 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 uh, in Gaza and the West Bank. And he said, don't forget, I still have Jerusalem. And what he meant by it is that, you know, there, Jerusalem is even bigger than Palestine, it could mobilize. And certainly the Israelis understood that Jerusalem could mobilize. It's not a, a coincidence that Ariel Sharon's provocative actions took place in the holiest of sites in Jerusalem. And it's not a surprise that the Palestinians call the second Intifada Al-Aqsa Intifada. And this was not a Hamas terminology. This was a Fatah terminology. I think there was an attempt for the Palestinians to mobilize the broader Arab and Muslim world uh, at, a, at, a, at a time when they felt uh, uh, their, their hand was weak. And, and certainly the Israelis uh, uh, sought to do the same globally, to mobilize support uh, for what was seen to be an existential conflict that emerged after the collapse of, of, of uh, the negotiation in 2000. And 9-11, in essence, was added another layer uh, because that layer um, provided a, a new uh, polarization, particularly the U.S. and its allies on the one hand and what was termed the Muslim world on the other, that played into the hands of each side and actually – uh, the Israelis were, ex uh, uh, to some extent, Sharon was very happy with that kind of divide. Uh, on the other hand, the Palestinians were also happy by that kind of divide by virtue of mobilizing broader support globally. So I think that, um, you know, we, we have to, if you, if you look at the past decade and the events of the past decade, uh, those two events, the collapse of, of negotiation in 2000 <laughs> and 9-11, contributed dramatically to the kind of discourse that emerged that was much more rich in religious symbolism <coughs> and mobilized along these lines, both in Israel and the Palestinian areas. This is not to say that there has not been profound changes sociologically and, and politically internally, but this is really, I think, the bigger danger here in, in framing the picture and framing the conflict. And we need to go, just like we have here in America, we have to walk away from that Islamic world discourse of confrontation that followed 9/11, we start have to we, we need to walk away from the discourse of the uh, of, of of the past decade on the on the Israeli-Palestinian front. Now let me go to the second point I want to make, which is about religion and the legitimation of the state. And I think we need to have some clarity in our thinking about the legitimacy of Israel, the legitimacy. Of, of Palestinian nationalism or legitimacy of states in the region. Um, religion is, has been an important part of the narrative of every community. Certainly it's been part of even the narrative of secular Zionism. Uh, and it's been a, a part of uh, 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 the discourse in the Palestinian areas, even among the secularists. But each side has the right to their own narrative. Uh, no one will be able to take that away from, including religious narratives. And how Israelis def see their legitimacy of their state is their business. Um, whether or not it's tied to a religious faith, it's their business. How Palestinians see their legitimacy is their business. But let's not get confused. That's not the way we in the international community ascribe legitimacy the legitimacy of Israel, or the legitimacy for that matter of Jordan, or the legitimacy of Kuwait, does not derive from their historical narrative. It derives from one simple thing, that they're members of the United Nations. A states are legitimate to the extent that they're members of the UN. And the very basis of Israeli legitimacy as a state in international eyes, I'm not talking about it in its own people, but in international eyes, is the same basis of legitimacy for rendering the West Bank, Gaza, and the Golan Heights as occupied territories from which Israel is obligated to withdraw. It is the same basis. And we need to have clarity in our own thinking from the outside, whether I'm talking about the United States or analysts in the international community, that people have a right to their narratives, but the 
Judgment of legitimacy in the international system is very clear. It's not about the narrative. It's not that one can take it away from it, but that's not the basis of judgment. Third, Jerusalem. And I think, obviously, uh, uh, this is, in my judgment, actually, Jerusalem is the most difficult issue, even bigger, more difficult than the right of return. And the reason for it is that I think Jer Jerusalem is multiple issues. It's not just one issue. Uh, one issue is obvious, which is uh, the, the religious importance to both Jews and Muslims, and for that matter, Christians. Um, and, but another issue, I think it's also an identity question that transcends even the religious, and that is for secular Israelis or secular Jews or secular Arabs or secular Muslims. Uh, Jerusalem is a core issue uh, of identity. And so it's not about religion only. It's about it being a core issue of identity for all of these communities, including those that are secular. But again, let's not confuse importance with matters of sovereignty. Sovereignty and importance are not the same thing. I think you can have Jerusalem is the most important holy site for Christians, bar none, certainly more important than Bethlehem and more important than Nazareth. But that has nothing to do with any Christian claim to sovereignty over Jerusalem. And I think that it certainly is important for Muslims and it certainly is important to Jews. And in that sense, it's a complicating factor that I think cannot be escaped. And in some ways you can't separate the narrative so well because it is so important to both communities. But from the judgment of, of on the outside, one has to differentiate analytically, nonetheless, the issue of sovereignty from the issue of ties that are religious or even historic, because the two are not identical, and they must be kept separated. I happen to think uh, that it is such a core issue uh, that I, I cannot imagine um, a solution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict that does not in some way uh, share or divide Jerusalem. I cannot imagine it. Uh, it just, I, I, I imagine no Palestinian, whether they're secular or religious, accepting a Palestinian state where they don't have a capital in Jerusalem. I cannot, ex I cannot imagine a, 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 a kingdom of Saudi Arabia or many others ever ending the conflict if the issue of Jerusalem is not in some ways divided. So in that sense, it's a critical issue. But in our thinking of a solution, we must uh, differentiate those categories. Finally, the point of Israel as a Jewish state. Uh, this conference has been very rich. Um, yesterday, a full day of discussion, much of it had to do with the definition of Israel as a Jewish state. And a lot of it has to do with Israel uh, as a Jewish state versus Israel as a democracy. That is something for the Israeli people in some ways to debate, both Jews and Arab citizens of the state of Israel. But again, I think we need to have clarity in terms of what the international community might expect or should expect. Um, I think um, in reality, um, uh, the international community tolerates many states that are defined in religious and ethnic terms the international community tolerates many states that don't treat their citizens equally. Uh, and the United States has very good relations with countries that don't tolerate, that, that don't treat their, their citizens very well, or that define themselves in exclusive terms. So the international community, in, in fact, is full of examples of this sort. This is not new in the international community. And it, it tolerates it and accepts it. But there is a big difference between tolerating and accepting and embracing. And I think that you know, to, to advocate something versus to accept something that is a reality is a big difference. And how Israel defines itself is certainly going to be something Israelis will have to do on their own, with their own people, both Arab and Jewish citizens. But what matters from the international point of view, whether this will be embraced or not, is what the consequences of that definition will be. Uh, we can accept Iran as the Islamic Republic of Iran or Syria as the Arab Republic of Syria or the Syrian Arab Republic, 
But when, if Syria were to uh, discriminate against their Kurdish population by virtue of that definition, or Iran were to, uh, as it does, uh, discriminate against uh, the Baha'is in Iran, we demand that that stop. We do not condone it. We might, we might accept it, in fact, because we can do little about it in the international system, but we advocate that it be changed. And in that sense, I think, in the end, for how Israel defines itself, uh, it is going to be a function of whether or not that definition is going to be consequential for all citizens because whatever states are, and they can be a state of a people, of an Arab people, or a Jewish people, or a Muslim people, in the end, they're also, maybe above all, states of their citizens. And if, in fact, the functional consequences of that definition are discriminatory against non-Jewish citizens, then we might be able to tolerate it, but I do not think we can possibly advocate it. Thank you very much. Edward Litvak. Uh, since my business is strategy, I try to stay away from Middle Eastern questions. But, so I presume, <laughs> I presume I've been invited here because um, 10 years ago, along with other people, published a book called Religion, the Missing Dimension of American Foreign Policy. And this book went on and on about all kinds of things, but the bottom line was we ought to pay attention to religion. We ought to overcome this kind of enlightenment, embarrassment about talking about religion, recognizing religious differences and so on. And in fact, we actually advocated rather administratively that there should be religion attaches in American embassies in the appropriate countries. Naturally, the State Department disregarded that, but that's fine. Now, the reason, by the way, why strategy shouldn't deal with the Middle East is because the essential conditions are absent. Last year, 15 Israeli citizens, including, I think, some Arabs, were killed. <coughs> Hezbollah, the formidable Hezbollah, and the, the uh, scary Hamas, and 17 other organizations which eat and drink every day, have meetings, headquarters, directors, deputy directors, all of them together killed 15 Israeli citizens. 27 Palestinians died in the West Bank. More than 15 Israeli citizens were killed at some intersection because, uh, no, 22 uh, were killed in some place because of some uh, traffic accident. In other words, if the Battle of Gettysburg had, had featured six people from the south and nine from the north dying, you can imagine the American Civil War would still be continuing. In the realm of strategy, peace is brought about by war, the sufferings and destruction of war. But since the Israelis are, they don't practice war seriously, the uh, Arab side cannot practice it seriously, naturally war doesn't bring peace. In Gaza, things are rather better because in Gaza there are atrocious sufferings and they rebound to the bad reputation of Israel, the siege. But there, as everybody knows, it's an arm wrestling between the Israeli government and the Egyptian government, the two governments which are accused of being in bed together, arm wrestling, the Israelis trying to persuade Mubarak to take Aza back with apologies for having made the mistake of taking away from Egypt in the first place. You know, these accidents happen. Now, in regard to religion and politics in Egypt, I agree with the consensus, and more specifically with the phraseology we just heard from Shibli Talhami, which is that dafka, as they say in Hebrew, punkt in German. As a matter of fact, the religion dimension in the Palestinian context is less, less uh, determining, and very often it's politics using religion, even though religion conditions the parameters of it, the variables are not, you know, and you have all these multiple things. But the problem uh, in the region is not true at all. In the region, the religious factor is terrifically important. However, it's important in a rather odd way, the same way as class is important in the analyzing British politics. One of the films that didn't get the Oscar last night is called Education, <laughs> and it's a story set in the 1960s. It's actually a very good film, but incomprehensible to Americans, I think. <laughs> they can't understand it because they don't know the role of class in British life. 
Also incomprehensible, without studying the role of class in British life, is why the Tories, which were winning way ahead in the polls, have now collapsed, and apparently Labour will win. You cannot understand it. Now, the reason you cannot understand how the Tories lose their superiority in three weeks because of some missteps from Mr. Cameron, the upper-class guy who goes to show himself a proletarian by biking to work, and then in the photograph they show the, the Bentley or, of his driver with the chauffeur, Pete, <laughs> following him. <laughs> Things of that sort. The, now, it, in other words, the problem with class in British politics is the systematic misrepresentation of class. That is, class would be easy, to, it would be a very nice key to British politics if it wasn't for the fact that everybody is constantly misrepresenting themselves. Labour Party people who wouldn't dream of sending their children to public, to a state school and only to what they call you know, private schools and so on. These guys pretend to be people of people and so on. In the region, we have the following. Syria is owned by the Assad clan. The Assad clan are actually Nusairis. Nusairis. Now, anybody who is passably an Orthodox Muslim cannot accept the Nusairis as Muslim, and they never were. They celebrate the Virgin Mary, and they drink wine. <laughs> they, what do they do? They have rebranded themselves, and they call themselves Alawite, which implies Ali and so on, which uh, refers to their ancient origins as a Shia split-off, which even serves some confusion with the Alawites of Turkey, who are entirely different, entirely different. The fact that the Nusairis, that is to say, the people ru ruling Syria, are not really Muslims, um, it forces the Assad clan to be more, quote, Muslim than other Muslims, of course. And because they are Arabs, the Nusairis, but, so they don't have this problem. The Iranians, on the other hand, as you all know, the rulers in Iran, about 50% of the population in Iran are not Farsi, as an ethnically Iran Farsi, or if they are, and uh, about, you know, many of them who are in fact Farsi and are even 12 or Shia actually belong to different, radically different schools of religion. Radically different, uh, including a dominant one, really, in the theological circles that believes that the theological chiefs should not rule it. The Sunni, w viewing the Iranians, don't see Muslims there, other than the Kurd, most of the Kurds are Sunni Muslim, the Baluch are Sunni Muslim, the Khuzistani Arab are Arab and Shia, the coastal ones are there, but overall you can say that, uh, that uh, you, you, know, you, you have a, 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 a predominance of uh, the 12 Shia, uh, but they are not predominantly Farsi, because the largest population group are Azeris. Some Azeris are very assimilated and always have been. Khamenei himself can claim to be an Azeri, but many of them, the ones living in Azerbaijan itself, in the western part, really are not Farsi, and they've affirmed a different identity. In this context, what you have is this Iranian government, run by people who are not Arabs, naturally pretending to be more Arabs than the Arabs. The other ones who have to be. The most extreme assertion of the Palestinian cause must be by people who are not Arabs at all. People, incidentally, who have never attacked the Jews. And people, incidentally, the government of Iran is the one in which the only one where there's a large Jewish community which lives unmolested and with more rights than other religious minorities. Now it's quite cold in Tehran. You know, there's still a lot of snow in the mountains. It hasn't melted as much as in Washington. And the, the schools which are best heated are the ones of the Jewish community. They're heated at the expense of the Tehran municipality. That arrangement with the heating in the winter was made by the former mayor of Tehran, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, who was very assiduous in painting the schools and repairing the plumbing and the question of how much fuel to supply. So in the Muslim school, they have to wear full woolen clothes. In the Jewish school, they can go with light clothes. And these are the same people who are, same gentlemen who speaks about 
his, about the Holocaust and, and every other week says he wants to kill at least the Israeli Jews. And so it's the only place where you have a large, unmolested Jewish community and uh, which prefers to threaten launching missiles, but they're not actually doing so. And then you have Hezbollah, which of course is Shia, legitimate, they're all the Shia, they're in southern Lebanon, but they constantly have to um, you know, pretend that it doesn't make any difference. So only Shia. In fact, you, I can produce you any number of people and diplomats uh, from the various Muslim countries, Arab countries in Washington, who tell you there's no difference between Sunni and Shia. The only difference was engineered by the British. Now, as I just published a book on the grand strategy of the Byzantine Empire, I can tell you that they were never able to handle their Christians because the conflict between the Chalcedonian Christians and the Monophysites led to the downfall of the, the loss of the Eastern Provinces. And finally, the Byzantine Empire was smashed by the Catholics, which was a split between the Catholics and what we now call the Orthodox, and which led to the Fourth Crusades and leaving very little there, eventually to be taken by the Ottoman. But they didn't know how to handle the Christians, but they sure knew how to handle the Muslim. And for, for a couple of centuries, they lived off the distinction between the Fatimid Caliphate of Egypt, who were Shia, but not Twelvers, like the Iranians of today, Seveners, Ismailis. Fatimid Shia, the difference between the Fatimid Shia and the Abbasid, the remnants of the Abbasid. Within the Abbasid, the principal frontline enemy was Saif al dawla celebrated by the great Arab poet Al-Mutanabi in his wonderful, irreverent, and funny poets. Saif al dawla was a Shia. Very important point, and... It made the difference. In other words, it, it wasn't exactly the British who started the distinction between Sunni and Shia. It was there a thousand years before. It was heavily political at the time, as it still is. But it's like, just like in a British class system, hard to analyze because it's always systematically misrepresented. People who say it doesn't matter, it matters terribly. Whenever they say to you this doesn't matter, it's because it does matter. And how it works is very complex. In Iran itself, long before they get to quarrel with a heretical group like the Baha'i and persecute them, they have a tremendous problem. Uh, you know, the last act of violence in Iran was the demolition of the Sufi center in Gum. In Gum, there was a Sufi center attended by thousands of people, and they went with bulldozers and destroyed it. So again, you know, they, they represent themselves as united, they're not. And the additional factor, of course, is that the 12 Shia of Iran today has evolved enormously with all these things that never existed, brand new, new innovations, which are very alar alarming to Orthodox Muslims and Sunni. Uh, I mean, the institution of Ayatollah is rather newer than the Exxon Company, which goes back to the Exxon Standard of New Jersey. It goes back to 1867. There were no Ayatollahs in 1867. So what we have here is ancestral, millennial things that actually were manufactured three weeks ago. What you have are people who are, have secular motivations, who adopt the language of religion. You have people who have secular self-presentations who are conditioned by it. And these things always pop out. I mean, remember in the famous uh, French, when the war starts in Algeria, the insurgency starts in Algeria, the French say, Algerie Francaise. And the answer of the FLN should have been Algerie Algerienne. But it wasn't. It was Algerie Musulman. And why was it Musulman? Because they were having a huge quarrel internally in the FLN between leftist revolutionaries, Muslim traditionalists, and they won. They killed each other over it. They continue to kill each other over it. And I'll stop with that. And just if you look at the numbers of that little conflict, that's 100,000. 100,000 Algerian people have been killed by other Algerian people because of religion, not between Sunni and Shia. They're all Sunni, but because different interpretations of the weight of religion in life and social or 
ancient political quarrels, even regional quarrels, masquerading that way. So given all this that's going on around the Jews and the Arabs in Palestine, including the Christian Arabs and so on, uh, it is actually religion is playing less of a role in the Palestinian-Israeli case than in the others all around. Um, finally, I can't refrain from saying something. I just came, I just suffered, um, I, I went, I just had the terrible suffering of spending a weekend in Venice in the Fondazione Cini. The weather wasn't that great the first day, but the second day was beautifully sunny. There weren't many tourists, so Venice was enjoyable. And we had this very sedate conference on the Middle East. The Israeli side was represented by genuinely hardline people headed by their deputy prime minister. And the Arab side was represented by genuinely pragmatic people, business people, and some different. And it was so sedate that the Dubai representation did not mention the word Mossad. So the only person who wasn't sedate, the only person who was emotional, who bitterly attacked the Egyptians, evoking a response by the Egyptian ambassador for having abandoned the leadership of the Arab nation. And the wonderful days of Nasser. Where are the wonderful days of Nasser? You know, that is, that's a guy who impoverished Egypt and led it to defeat. But to him, a great hero. And who was celebrating Nasrallah. And who was absolutely deliquescent in his compliments for the Turks who were coming back to you know, bring the great wisdom of Turkey, their proven ability of international affairs, of which you can hear a great deal if you go to Central Asia, where they were first welcomed and then kicked out. So who was doing all this? Professor of the London School of Economics, who teaches Middle East. Who is he? Farwaz Gerges. Farwaz Gerges. You can't understand his vehemence, which was so inappropriate, here in the Fondazione Cini, everybody was so calm and serene. He's actually a Christian, naturally, and moreover, a Melkite. The Melkites, who are the most Western-oriented of all the religious minorities in the Middle East. But you can visualize him. He's teaching Middle East at the London School of Economics in that particular atmosphere that is now in London, with all these Middle Eastern students there, some of whom are very radical and committed, so he, the Christian, Melkite, whose family fled the Middle East because they didn't want to be anywhere near Muslims, having Arabic because uh, he's the recipient, you know, of MacArthur money and Carnegie and this and that. And there he was being fervent in attacking the Jews and Israel and everything and the Egyptians for colluding with them, the Saudis, the Saudis for colluding with them and celebrating Nasrallah and Ahmadinejad and so on. So in other words, religion plays a role. The role is not determinate necessarily, but is always terrifically complex because it doesn't cut straight. It always cuts the opposite way, just like in British politics. Thank you. <laughs> well, um, there's a... There's a lot on the table, um, and uh, we'll, uh, we had a strategist who talked about uh, misdirection and uh, political scientists who talked about competing narratives, and the philosopher turned politician who talked about getting past narratives. So uh, um, let's open it up now for comments and questions from the floor. Uh, if speakers could please identify themselves, and to whom may I turn to for the first It was. Let's start with this gentleman here on the side. Hey, could you just hang on till the, till the microphone reaches you? Okay. My name is Warren Manison. I'm with the Unity Coalition for Israel, and I find um, the discussion relation to the importance of religion is is attempt to downplay what that is, if we talk about achieving a resolution of the conflict, uh, the fact that we have a side that does not recognize the existence of the other side is certainly a detriment to achieving that resolution. And religion has been part of the 
seen there for a long time. In 1929, I seem to, I'm not that old, but I seem to remember Jews in um, <clears throat> Hebron were killed by um, Arabs, you know, when the British were still there under the British mandate, and that's been the history of the area. So when we look at the overall conflict, we suddenly Excellent. discover that religion is critical. It is part of an ideology. It's part of why we see today the Arab world and Abbas in particular refusing to accept that Israel is a Jewish state, which it is of varying degrees. But number two, of course, is how do you achieve a, achieve a resolution of a conflict uh, no, where I you have one that. side oh, constantly attempting to delegitimize the other side? We have the NGOs operating under the auspices paid for whatever by Palestinian sources funding Saudi Arabian uh, campuses in this country. Um, there's something going on this week in many of the campuses, especially out west, called Apartheid Week attempting to delegitimize Israel. So how do we achieve a resolution of a conflict where there's continual incitement to violence, even against Oslo? If we remember back in Oslo, the number of agreements without Yasser Arafat definitely call for elimination of incitement to violence, as well as preservation of religious sites, and that, none of that held. But that goes on today. Last week, for example, the Abbas named a plaza in, Nab in uh, Ramla in honor of a martyr who was a, terrorist, um, who was a terrorist who killed 32 Israelis. So given that kind of an atmosphere, how is it possible without a total secession of this constant incitement to violence? Thank you. I'd like to hear from Okay. Um, and we are a very um, – a similar question came from uh, – our overflow room, uh, which is uh, what place should or should not religious claims, concerns, and narratives have in negotiations? So, uh, Shibley, why don't you open? Well, let me, let me just uh, say that, you know, a lot of the things that you, you said um, really had less to do with religion. Uh, I, I mean, when you, uh, you know, you, you combined all sorts of things that are advocated by both religious and non-religious groups, secular and non-secular groups, uh, so, it, it, you know, how much is, how much of a fact of religion in all of this is? Now, let me give you just some numbers, examples, you know. Uh, let's look at um, the Arab world where arguably religion is actually playing a bigger role, as was actually acknowledged here, uh, than it is on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict um, for a variety of reasons, because I think the nationalism in Palestine still anchors the movement more than religion. Um, if you look at public opinion polls, actually, uh, I ask people every year, you know, how they identify themselves, assuming that they have complex identity, like most people. They're Jordanian and, and, and Muslim and, and Arab and, or Christian or and, and Arab and Jordanian all at the same time. Um, over the, the in, in average in 2009, um, uh, roughly about one-third of Arabs identify themselves as Muslim first. Two-thirds identify themselves either first with the state or as Arabs. Actually, you know, it's equally divided, almost one-third, one-third, one-third. So the, 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 the Islamic identity is not the overwhelming identity in the Arab world. It is not, and it, that shows up. Second, uh, even pertaining to the principled opposition to Israel, uh, uh, in the questions we, uh, that, that we pose, we try to get at this group of who among the public is most opposed or in principle opposed to any uh, two-state solution uh, in which Israel would have to be accepted. Uh, we have about a quarter of people, even in this environment of in 2009 when, when the prospects of peace were very small, we have roughly only a quarter who in principle opposed any peace with Israel. So I think what, what, we're, what I'm suggesting is that I think people overplay. Uh, we, we highlight the, 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 the issue of religion. I think we bias um, the discourse by doing that. We do ourselves disservice. Um, I think we've done it in America in thinking about our relations with Muslim-majority countries. Um, I think, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, if, you, if you look at our relations with India, let's say, if you look at um, 
the differences between, in religion between um, Christianity and Hinduism, let's say, uh, they're, they're vastly bigger than they are between you know, Judaism and Christianity or, uh, uh, on the one hand and, and Islam on the other, or the three of them across. Um, and, and yet, if you look at um, the relations, both in terms of public opinion, public attitudes toward the U.S. and India are positive, and vice versa. Relations are very warm and have been even in that decade of troubled relations with, with, with much of the world. Uh, but if there, was a, if there was a strategic conflict were to emerge tomorrow between the U.S. and India, and I don't expect any, but if there is one to emerge tomorrow, I'm willing to bet you that most of our analysts in the next morning are going to start scrutinizing uh, Indian religion and, and looking at the differences in the caste system and all of the all of this stuff that they have, and they're going to argue that that is the prime. That's what people do, and I think that does a disservice. Uh, I don't think that's what the issue is. The conflict between Israel and the Palestinians is not, at its core, a religious conflict. Religion ought to be respected. I don't see a threat in religion. Religion has existed uh, in, among Jews and, and Muslims and, and, and Christians. Uh, I respect religious communities. What we're talking about here is religion being used as an instrument for politics, which is not a function of religiosity. And, and as I said and I, I, I sought to argue, is that unfortunately secularists themselves have been uh, partly to blame for increasing this religious mobilization, in large part for strategic reasons, to mobilize support at a global level at a time of crisis, but the outcome has been to change the discourse in a way that's detrimental to everyone. Edward, do you want to comment on this? Yeah, I would uh, also like to add that um, with the exception of the Catholics, the Catholics are a big problem because they have a pope who pronounces all other religions provide us with a multiplicity of leaders, some of whom are always willing to endorse an agreement, particularly if you invite them for dinner. <laughs> and the mechanics are, are that if you resolve the problem by agreement by people who may be personally religious or not, but they do so in a political frame, then the religious endorsement or acceptance comes along. If there is no agreement politically, then among the ways of mobilizing resistance to the situation will be obviously the religious one. There are, but we must recognize one thing. There are macro, universal macro waves in terms of the propensity of people to mobilize in religious lines. I direct your attention to Mindanao in the Philippines, of Yama in Thailand, of the Nigerian, um, you know, just in the last 48 hours, 300 people were killed in Nigeria in a conflict between um, Fulani Muslims and the sound Christian Nigerians. There, is a, there are waves where the total level of religious activity rises and waves that fall. These waves don't last forever, so with a little patience, we can wait for them. They tend to last only about 100 years, 150, and then things come down. So we are in a period of higher propensity and readiness to be mobilized. But, as Shibley points out, the mobilization is political. And then, as I say, if you mobilize for peace instead of war, then you can always find religious people who endorse the peace. And you can give them proper advertising and publicity and so on. Yeah, just uh, I think looking at, at the issue from the point of view of Israel, um, maybe there is something that should be said about the role of religious groups within Israel that are actually creating a situation politically that, are, that prevents now um, the Netanyahu government from pursuing um, a real serious move towards uh, a peace agreement. And there, I think, we, we, Yoram showed it yesterday uh, with regard to the orthodox and ultra-orthodox attitude towards democracy, um, the same is true uh, if you cut across the Israeli society, the support for the peace process correlates highly to religious beliefs. And when you have a coalition that is dependent on the religious parties, the likelihood that that coalition is able to do a political move 
is fairly limited. It's not that there aren't religious people, as you rightly said, who would support a peace agreement, but there is no religious party who would do that in Israel. And that makes the division or the debate within Israel, rather than the debate between the Israelis and the Palestinians, very, very much a religious debate. So I agree with the common assumption here that the debate between the Israeli and the Palestinians is not moving at the moment. I hope it will not move in the future also along religious lines, but the debate within Israel about the peace process is very much running along religious lines. Thank you. I'll take a question from this gentleman. This microphone coming to you. Uh, and then we'll go to that gentleman and this one. We'll, we'll group these questions together, okay? Uh, Shlomo Fisher from um, the Van Leer Institute and in Hebrew University. Um, I agree very much with Professor Telhami's Tal, Tal, um, um, rendition of uh, religious nationalism. I would put it that um, that I think that religion is an idiom in which to talk about, in which to express an organic or an integral nationalism, as opposed to more say, liberal or individualistic forms of nationalism or whatever. That's how I would. But I think those these are factors which have to be taken into account. And I think it's true both on, this, on the, in the in question of settlers in Kushimunim, and it's also true, I suspect, though my knowledge of the Muslim world is somewhat less, um, um, in regard to Hamas, which, which I think has a different version of Palestinian nationalism and uses a religious idiom to express that version. But I think that has to be taken into account that we have to understand these things better. Um, that's comment number one. Comment number two, I do not agree with Professor Talhami's analysis of the effect of the breakdown of the um, um, Camp David agreements, uh, Camp David discussions in 2000. I think that from an Israeli, from an internal Israeli perspective, and there, there are also other Israelis in the room, and I'm sure people will disagree with me, but from a, an internal Israeli perspective, I think that if you look at the Al-Aqsa, if the second Intifada, as we call it, well, Al-Aqsa, Intifada Al-Aqsa, um, then um, the suicide bombing uh, brought about a pragmatization of thinking in Israel, and that uh, a certain kind of pragmatization and that had to do with the erection of the wall. Now, the people who objected to the wall were the religious right, was Gush Munim, um, and Sharon, if anybody recalls. The wall came from uh, the finance ministry, and that, they were the initiators, and they prevailed upon, prevailed upon, and that's the most pragmatic of quarters. You can't run an economy if you have people blowing up in your supermarkets. So, um, and that's where the wall, and that pragmatic, and that pragmatic um, sort of perspective prevailed until 2005. And it prevailed also, and was expressed in the disengagement from Gaza, which was that, a sort of pragmatism, not the sort that Yuli Tamir was talking about, but a sort of pragmatism. And I think that the reemergence of integral hardline nationalism came in, in Israel, I'm talking about the Inner perception in Israel, I'm talking about the international community. The inner perception was this so-called failure of the disengagement from Gaza, where notwithstanding Professor Lutwak's remarks about 15 dead, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, um, it's true that the, you know, that the rockets from, from, from Gaza didn't kill a lot of people. That's absolutely true. In the Israeli perception, the continued attacks from Hamas-controlled Gaza onto the settlements around uh, uh, the Gaza Strip uh, indicated a failure of pragmatic policy and a reemergence of a less pragmatic and a more principled uh, thing. My third remark is that, well, just one, one third remark, I'll be very brief, I'm sorry to, to take up all this time, but, um, and that is that I was a little bit troubled by Yuli's remarks in the sense that, again, it's a reproduction of a discourse in which there's an enlightened pragmatic group which is working in an enlightened pragmatic way to solve the problem in, from an Israeli inner perspective. And then there's a whole bu bunch of, another group of people who are a bunch of yahoos who are, who are, you know, have these existential religious crazy concerns, etc. So if you want to, utilizing Yuli's term of creative ambiguity from yesterday, I, which I very much endorse, then I would suggest that a creative ambiguity has to be where the people have, who have so-called existential concerns have a place. Thank you very much. Take a question from 
Can, can I just say in response to this long diatribe, I want to make it clear that I am one of the yahoos. I just want you to understand that, okay? I'm not a pragmatist. I don't belong to the Ramat Asheron School of Strategy. Okay. I have a question. Um, of the several sources of conflict between Israelis and Palestinians, it seems to me there is one that is fundamentally religious, and that is not Jerusalem in general, but that is the Western Wall, the Haram al-Sharif, the Temple Mount in particular. And, and the uh, importance of it for the Muslim community goes back to the uh, night journey surah of the Quran, and the importance of it for Jews goes back to multiple sections of the Tanakh, uh, and it wouldn't be so serious if they weren't in such close proximity, but the Temple Mount is literally a stone's throw from the Western Wall. Uh, so how do you, and you may look at other issues in a much more secular fashion, but it seems to me you have to deal with this issue largely on a religious basis, and what way do you see that there's any room for compromise or, or dealing effectively with this subject? And we'll take this one from this gentleman and then we'll let them respond and then we'll do another kind of, we'll get to everyone else, don't worry. Yeah, I see it, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to it. Uh, my name is Bernard Avishai. Um, I, I think, uh, one has to rise to to defend the word religion here a little bit, uh, <laughs> um, but I, because you know, I, I, because I think all of us have a certain understanding of the poignancy of the questions religions ask. Uh, you know, people, as Emerson says, give prayer like trees give apples. You know, we we have a kind of religious imagination. All of us. I don't think that's really the problem. I think we're talking about um, a very much more cult-like religious expression. Um, and I think both Palestinians and Israelis have their versions of this. Uh, I'll speak about the Israeli side since I live in Jerusalem mostly, although I probably live in Microsoft Office more than I live in Jerusalem. Um, and the, the, the issue in Jerusalem, I think, is that we have engendered in and around Jerusalem, in the uh, colonies around Jerusalem and so on, uh, a tremendously closed, fanatic group of people connected to a conception of what they want to transform the landscape into, which the vast majority of Israelis don't necessarily subscribe to. But you know, uh, politics isn't just winner take all, it's also loser spoil everything. And you have a situation in, in Israel where this group of people, perhaps 20% of the population, I think you could say their sympathizers may get up to 35%, are simply too powerful to be moved by the majority. I mean, no, you know, people, people in and around Jerusalem, whom I've often called Judeans, um, and, and often call themselves Judeans, don't uh, oppose a Palestinian state the way New Hampshire opposes an income tax. I mean, this for them is a, uh, is a deeply existential commitment. And the real problem in Israel is that Israelis on the, on the coastal plain don't want to fight Judeans for the sake of Palestinians. And I think there's a Palestinian version of that. So I don't think that religion is the source of the conflict, but I think that there are cult-like forces inside each nation, which does account for why we're so stuck. Because we have majorities that are unwilling to confront these deeply committed fanatic people for the sake of the other side. And I think, and here's a question, does <laughs> not that mean that <laughs> a, <laughs> does that not mean that, the, that we need an exterior force, we need a force from outside the conflict. We need a, a source from outside of Israel-Palestine to give support to the, to the middle majorities so that they have the courage to confront their fanatics. So that's, that's, that's a, a comment with, with, with a question. Let me just sort of uh, even make it more specific. You know, the United States has been involved with uh, the peace process. You have the Europeans involved. 
would it be helpful to the process with the UN if they basically said the objective is uh, 1967 borders with geographical swaps that take into account you know realities that have occurred you know since uh, the, the Six Day War. But anyway, there was a range of comments and uh, considerations. Let's uh, you can address them briefly, and then we'll we'll do the next wave of uh, of, of uh, merved questions. Uh, well, let, let me. Um, uh, uh, start uh, um, with with um, the questions that were were specific uh, to me, um, uh, particularly about the the consequences of um, of 9/11. Um, uh, I'm sorry, the consequences of of, of uh, the the 2000 failure at Camp David, the rise of the Intifada. Um, I, I think that that and 9/11 really. I remember it was it was you know within a year basically of each other. Uh, and and I think the two bec become kind of married. I think uh, in in the Palestinian case, uh, there is no question in my mind that um, the Intifada itself generated dramatic support for Palestinians among Arabs and Muslims outside uh, in, in a way that we had not seen really for the entire decade of the 1990s, because I think the decade of the 1990s, uh, in fact, some people said people no longer care about Palestine. I mean, we had interpretations in in our discourse by virtue of other issues that were on the table, and people understood the conclusion in the region, which is Palestine was on its way to uh, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict was on its way to a resolution, which is really what everybody assumed through throughout the 1990s until that big failure and then the ri and the rise of the Intifada. So then you have a mobilization, and the Palestinians and Arafat himself actually benefited from that because he was in a weak position and he wanted to show that he's able to draw support to people who think that it's a dead conflict and he has no strategic leverage. It's not the case. Now, with the Israelis, I think whether or not it was initially strategic, there's no question they saw it as, as, as certainly Sharon saw it as an existential threat in the suicide bombings. But it's 9-11 that changed the narrative and supported the Islamic world West narrative uh, for a variety of reasons. One reason was Sharon was extremely worried about the interpretation of 9-11 as it's a result of the support for Israel, not a result of Islamic fanaticism. And uh, that was the absolute most critical thing that he wanted to fight that day. And, uh, and obviously maintain American support and, and consolidate it at a time when there was an Islamic support that is increasing for the Palestinians. So that's what fueled it. It fueled it. The two come together. I think that fueled it more than people think. Now, on religion and, uh, and, 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 and Jerusalem, undoubtedly, I think, uh, th there's a core religious issue. Uh, but let's, let's be a little bit you know, honest about Jerusalem. I mean, uh, the holy basin in Jerusalem is one-third of a square mile. That's it. Uh, uh, what we call Jerusalem now was not what was Jerusalem in 1967, and certainly not in 1948. Uh, what we call even East Jerusalem now is 27 square miles. It was only two miles in 1967. These are not religious decisions. These are political decisions for defining what Jerusalem is, what the municipal boundaries of Jerusalem is. So the bottom line of these decisions, whether you, whatever you play with and, and, and governments can use the symbol of Jerusalem because it is such a core issue, even beyond religion, as I said, it's important even to secularists. I think it, is, it has that profound implication. Uh, if they, you know, the, 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 the bottom line boils down to this basin. I think that basin is difficult to tackle, undoubtedly. And that's why the UN resolution in 1947, the partition line, designated a special status for Jerusalem. It was understood that it's very complicated because of the, the profound religious importance. Uh, that's why the U.S., with all the support that the U.S. has given to Israel, more than any other nation on earth since 1948, still has not recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And there's a good, you know, there's a reason for that. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, there, there has to obviously be, you know, when we're talking about the sovereignty, I said it boils down to sovereignty on the sovereignty issue there's going to have to be some kind of exceptional status for the Holy Basin. Whatever you do with the rest of it, that's going to be critical. Now, um, the, on, on religion, um, 
I, I agree with um, with uh, um, uh, uh, Professor Avishai's uh, point about um, religion is still a major factor in each side's polity. Um, I, I agree with that. Um, but what you can say, you know, I, I mean, it's true about the politics of every society, you know, in, in terms of minorities that are passionate are going to be critical. That's true in the Palestinian areas. It's true in, in Israel. And the coalitions matter. Uh, I think what Yuli said, for example, in the current coalition, it's impossible to envision a real progress unless there is some, some loosening. Um, whether or not the paralysis, the political paralysis in Israel and in Palestine right now entails that they cannot possibly reach a peace on their own, I think is somewhat separated from the role of religion. I think there is a political paralysis, and I think the Israeli political system um, is such that uh, it, it produces paralysis, and I think the Palestinians are obviously paralyzed by the, by, by the basic division. Whether or not that could be overcome by direct intervention, what kind of intervention, uh, it, it's a big question. My own view is that without American mediation, uh, it is in, it's impossible to have a breakthrough. I, I don't think they're capable of it. I mean, and, and that's even without regard to the fact that you have on the Palestinian side a very peculiar situation of, a, of an entity that is actually under Israeli occupation negotiating as if it were a sovereign entity with the state of Israel. It's very uh, difficult to envision. We don't have m much precedence for this in the international community, uh, but clearly some kind of diplomatic, international diplomatic intervention is necessary. Well, would, if, if, if it was explicit about sort of the end point, you know, along the lines I mentioned, would that rein in uh, aspirations on the two sides and sort of like bound them in a realistic way? Um, I, uh, for, for a variety of reasons, I don't want really to comment on that specific part, <laughs> okay. uh, um, um, in, in part because I, I have a conflict of interest that I cannot, you know, basically put out that idea on this. Okay. Right. Um, <coughs> do, I, do either of you have yeah. a comment on yeah. the yeah. range yeah. of issues? Well, first. I have a methodological comment, and that is that if you are going to speak about religion, there is a word you're forbidden to use, and that word is cult. Because if you talk on a subject of religion, and then you say that I am, mine is a religion, you have a cult, uh, you know, the third guy has a superstition, you know, it doesn't help very much. Also, there's an issue, uh, I mean, 9-11 is very important in my book, because it was only after 9-11 that American presidents started speaking about Islam as a religion of peace. Until 9-11, they never said Islam was a religion of peace for some reason, which escapes me. As a matter of fact, there was a common belief, which had started for some reason around 639, that Islam was a militant religion, a militant religion. Only now, it turns out, it's a religion of peace. However, we, exit, we make things more exotic than we need to. Somebody just published a survey that the strongest determinant in America, people voting labor, uh, I mean labor, I mean being Democrats or Republicans, I mean I went to school in England, Democrats or Republicans is whether they go to church or not. That's a single indicator. But then you can see it in, you know, in a higher level of analysis, and you can say they go to church because in a more deeper sub-political way, they're culturally Republican. And in that sense that I recognize myself strictly among the yahoos and not among the enlightened and progressives and some. However, what is the bottom line as far as we're concerned? Uh, the bottom line is that if the uh, official mechanisms of state diplomacy and negotiations could function, then, and then you run into a religious problem, then it might be worthwhile to talk of it in these terms. Actually, what happens is that the basic political mechanisms cannot function. For example, I'm told there is a dispute over the Golan Heights. Now, under what configuration on earth can any imaginary any government you could ever imagine go to the Israeli public and say, 
give up the beautiful hills, give up that nice plateau, the wineries and the excursions, in order to end the conflict with Syria, that costs zero casualties, zero nothing. No conflict, no peace. How can you resolve things if you have no earthly reason to resolve it? I repeat, if the Germans and the French, instead of fighting the wars they did, had fought little skirmishes in which one Frenchman died, and, you know, half a German, Alsace-Lorraine would still be in dispute. So the basic reason there is no resolution is because the conditions for peace are absent. Namely, nobody's fighting. And when they fight, they're ineffectual. So you're talking about this stuff as if this was a real conflict? You know what real conflict is? 5,000 die Monday, 7 Tuesday. Wednesday, people start thinking that peace maybe is a good idea. Only the Jews and Arabs somehow want to have the blessings of peace without paying the price of war. It's like going to the restaurant, wanting to eat without paying the bill. No wonder this thing continues. It has been like this throughout history and in every other place in the world. Where again, for example, India and Pakistan, since every day thousands of Indians die in unnamed episodes in Mizoram and Manipur, Naxalites and so on, naturally the Kashmir thing doesn't burn. And final comment also from India. Recently some Christian missionaries were killed and they were burned to, to death in a hillside on the border between Orissa and Bengal, West Bengal. The Indian uh, CID uh, intervened after complaints the local police didn't do anything. The CID are very sophisticated, they interviewed the killers. And what happened is that one guy said he killed them because he's a Hindu and he's annoyed that they're converting Hindus to Christianity. The other guy who killed them said he's a Bengali nationalist who doesn't want Americans to be in India converting people. So it tells you that the fundamental issue was that there was a disequilibrium there in the presence of those people in highly contested Orissa with their horrible struggles going on over land. And then the, it was channeled into religious motivation for one of the Orissa killers and a nationalist motivation for another. So let us face the strategic issues, and when we do that, the religious issues will solve themselves. Thank you. Um, well, I, I think that the major issue that was raised concerning Israel uh, should be dealt with in very clear and honest terms. Um, I think that today the debate within Israel <laughs> about whether peace could be achieved, when it is debated in religious terms, it leads to the conclusion that nothing could be done. Now, some people believe in it truly, some people are cynical about it and abuse it. Uh, I remember Gula Cohen once having this uh, wonderful debate with me on the radio, and she said the following, she, and uh, for Gula Cohen, I would say she re truly believes that. Um, this generation, the God, God promised us the land, and therefore no one generation of Jews can make a decision to give it back. So I said to her, what would be a proper form in which where we can uh, make a decision? She said, if we can gather all Jewish generations together, we can make a decision. That was a wonderful ex you know, expression of actually don't take a decision, you have no authority to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, that is not in itself a problem, unless, and here I agree with uh, Bernie Avishai very much, unless there is a sense that if Israel will react in ways that contradict uh, the assumptions of the religious groups, it will face bloodshed. And I think that since the Rabin assassination, fear is a major factor in the Israeli society, and fear goes one way. It goes from the religious groups to the political arena. It's not uh, yahoos or intellectuals or enlightenment people, it's fear. And politicians in Israel fear the moment of a decision because they think there will be bloodshed. And what happened recently with religious groups deciding to um, support conscience 
or I don't, disobedience, I don't know exactly how to, the disobedience to evacuate settlements meant that they are actually sending a sign that it will not be only a threat to politicians, but a real rebellion in the army. There was a, an awkward debate going on in Israel. You should be aware of it. Because what happened was that when these people didn't want to evacuate, which was illegal outposts, what they said was, keep the army out of it. Keep the army out of the political debate, which was very strange because the army is up to here in the political debate. They are keeping and guarding the settlements for the last 30-something years, and they are guarding the same settlements and outposts that are about to evacuate now, but then the slogan was keep the army out. And, the really, and it came from very orthodox groups where the rabbis were involved, and it was underneath it also a layer of debate about whose authority should the soldiers, who are also rabbinical students, obey? Should they obey the rabbi? Should they obey the state? When this issue is up in the air, this is a real threat to the authority of the state. I, I, I had some disagreement, and I don't want to return now to the question whether the existence of Israel is grounded in religious terms, yes or no. But the fact now is the authority of the state is dependent on the agreement of the religious groups, and they are threatening, A, violence, B, breaking the structure of authority. This is a serious, this is a very serious threat. Now, taking into account what was said before that I dare not think about, uh, if this is a threat and there is no other threats around and the economy is doing well and everything is happy, then maybe there is no political will uh, to get into this debate. And therefore, just to answer your question, I'm, I don't have uh, a conflict of interest. I always had one interest, that this conflict will be solved. Um, I think that, yes, sh people should say time and again what will be the end result. I know it sounds frustrating. It's certainly for me something that I'm tired of doing. I sometimes sit in a government meeting or a cabinet meeting or a foreign affairs and security meeting and hear these people 25 years later saying, oh, the two-state solution is a must. And you say, oh, welcome. But it took us 30 years to get there. It will maybe take us another 30 years to make the case of Jerusalem clear, the case of the borders clear, the case that we will have to acknowledge <coughs> some sort of de a debate and resolution for uh, the right of return. There is no other way but just saying it, putting it on the table. And one thing that Netanyahu doesn't, I think, realize and should realize that whenever he said Jerusalem is not on the table, somebody will say to him, that is not a possibility. And the only people who can say it very clear and loud are the Americans. They should say, unless you put Jerusalem on the table, you know, save your time, do something better with your life. Then have proximity talks because there's nothing that could be done without talking about Jerusalem. And then I agree with everything you said. I mean, it would be hard and difficult and sensitive and religious and problematic. And if we manage to uh, make the debate around the Holy Basin rather than about Shuafat, that no Israeli think that Shuafat is really Jerusalem, or Beta Kerem, that no Palestinian really think that Beta Kerem is Jerusalem, then we'll be uh, concentrating our efforts on the right issues. But it must be said and it must be said clearly, and I'm afraid that this administration, that I had very high hopes that, that, that this administration will say clear things, is not really saying them. And that is a huge, I think, um, um, escape for everyone in the, in the region that they don't have to now deal with the issue. The Palestinians said Jerusalem on the ta not on the table, then there's nothing to talk about. The, Israel say, the Israelis said Jerusalem is not on the table. That's the... Uh, for us a precondition for the negotiations and we're stuck. Uh, just a clarification because I think it was a misunderstanding of what I meant by conflict no, of I interest. Did, I, um, I, uh, I, I actually I apparently misunderstood what Rob asked because uh, I thought Rob asked me what I'm advising the administration which I didn't want to put on the table but I can certainly I'm, I'm free to give my opinion on, on this and Absolutely. would be happy to do it so it's, it's not a um, uh, so I, it was a, a confusion as to what the question okay. was. I didn't want to betray the private, what I, you know, uh, but the, the, um, I, I, I think that we're, we're near the end of the line on the two-state solution. Um, uh, I think if, if it doesn't happen on this administration's clock, yeah. uh, it's unlikely to happen, with or without religion. It's unlikely to happen. If it doesn't happen, uh, Arabs and Israelis, uh, 
certainly Palestinians and Israelis are, are going to be in conflict for at least another generation. What form or shape it takes, how it develops, how bloody it will be, I have no idea. Uh, but that's what's at stake. Uh, and I think that it's not in anybody's interest and certainly not in American interest and not in the international community's interest. This issue, whether you like it or not, remains the prism of pain through which most Arabs and many Muslims see America and the world. And uh, th its implications go farther than just what happens on the Palestinian-Israeli front. And I think for that reason, uh, you know, what we do as Americans and what the international community does is not just doing as charity work for Israelis and Palestinians. It is because the, the ramifications are profound for our interests, and that means that we ought to be very aggressive in the pursuit of an end to this conflict. Well, we're running short on time, but I wanted to come over to the uh, woman uh, here in the, on this side, and then we'll, get, we'll collect a couple more and uh, give our panelists a final opportunity to, uh, uh, to respond. Well, thank you very much. I'm Sahar Kamis from the Department of Communication, the University of Maryland. Uh, just concerns me that it seems that religion um, is seen in one of three different ways. Either it is excluded or it is exploited or it is being blamed. Uh, excluded by those who think that, uh, as the gentleman who left the room, um, I think Mr. Shromo said, uh, that only a secular uh, pragmatist uh, approach would be a rational one that can resolve the conflict. But if we invite religion in, it's only going to ignite emotions and therefore uh, it's going to ignite the conflict even further, make things go out of hand. Or exploited by those who want to use it as a political tool to uh, mobilize uh, you know, people in a direction that might or might not be the best way for them or blamed for being a divisive force, a force that divides people and you know, separates them and keeps them apart from each other because it's either me or you, it's a zero-sum game, but we cannot coexist. My question is, and my hope is, couldn't we positively cultivate religion in a way that draws on the similarities and the commonalities between the three great religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam? Because these similarities are there, and these common grounds are there, and the similarities are much greater than the differences, but the differences are always seen in the media because they are seen within the narrow lens of conflict only. So what about raising and, and actually uh, nurturing some kind of rational, reform, religious uh, you know, resurgence in the three generations of Islam, Judaism, and Christianity to bring about more commonality and therefore better future for all people? Thank That's you. my question. Very clear. Let's just Let's just, uh, we've got a lot, but, but let's just work the microphone there to the woman in the back, to, to that gentleman, and then this one. That will close it out there, okay? Can you just pass the microphone across? Where's already moving. Okay. Uh, yes. Hi, my name's Susan Podziba. I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. And I feel like we finally got to the focus of religion in the dispute, which is the Holy Basin. And I'm wondering if all of the attempts to avoid that issue have really been, have, are really at the end of the line and if the linchpin to the dispute is now to really focus, as the last questioner said, on the real issues of the Holy Basin, which is a religious conflict and which requires conversations among religious leaders to address. And I would refer you to a recent book by Ron Hasner called um, War on Sacred Grounds. And he identifies these kinds of wars or conflicts as a specific subset of conflict and suggests that when this has been successful, successfully addressed, it's been because religion and politics, though we would like to as assume that those don't uh, coincide well, they can be made to. Thank and you. Okay, oh, sorry. Okay. So my question is, how can we, is it possible to focus the discussions on the Holy Esplanade as a way of doing something different from what we've been doing for the last 30 years? Okay. Um, this gentleman here. Oh, why, don't you, why, why don't you take that gentleman with a microphone uh, and then this one. Hang on, sir, one second. Go uh, ahead. This is Vladimir Pismen, and Liga Techs. Uh, I have a question to Professor Talhami. Uh, I want to ask you about uh, Palestinians. You mentioned Israeli Palestinians. Uh, for how 
for how m for how many millenniums uh, people of Palestinian, so-called Palestinians, existed as a country uh, or centuries? Uh, what cities uh, they built and uh, why uh, they have a claim to Jerusalem? For for how long, historically, Jerusalem was a uh, uh, capital of Palestinian state and so forth. Okay, and this gentleman, and I'm uh, yeah, afraid we're going to have to close it there. Go ahead. Yeah, for Wiesel, uh, correspondent of the Jerusalem Report. A uh, question uh, to Professor Nordwag. Uh, what I understand from what you're saying is that in order to, to solve a conflict, there really has to be a, a, a big war before you can solve it. So does that mean that the peace camp basically has to wage a big, big war from the tactical point of view, to achieve peace. Uh, okay, um, let's give each each uh, speaker, Edward, give you a uh, final opportunity to respond. For, I did point out that uh, we live in a period of high activism for religion, and God is especially active these days because uh, Governor Patterson of New York has just stated that God orders him to be governor of New York State. Uh, <laughs> You know, so um, uh, the fact about the three monothe monotheistic religions and so on. The truth is that uh, the three have always actually recognized each other, and at different times they have extended tolerance to each other. At the time where they were massacring and t utterly destroying by massacre people who didn't belong to those three. So, for example, you have the Christians enter what is today central Germany and massacre the Saxon pagans, killing pagans and so on. And, of course, they didn't, they bothered the Jews now and then, but they didn't ever exterminate the Jews. In fact, the Jews were the only, uh, the Jews viewed their history as a history of persecution in Europe, but it could be viewed as a history of privilege because every other group that was not Jewish was completely massacred. So they couldn't hang around and complain about discrimination because they didn't exist. And the Muslims, of course, had the official forms of recognition of the Christians and the Jews and so on. Then for political reasons, they added the Zoroastrians and so on. But, you know. So there's always been that element of coexistence between the Christians, as you point out. Um, and I, in, in his practical manifestation today, is that uh, notwithstanding um, the noisy characters and important characters here and there, the fact is you can always get religious people to endorse any agreement the secular people can reach. But, of course, then again, a lot of the people who disguise themselves as secular are motivated by complex parameters, including the religious one and so on. And uh, the only reason, you know, this whole thing is uh, acquired the greatest salience uh, is because uh, there is this global, global kind of internal struggle between different kinds of Muslims who mostly kill each other, but who debate each other in terms of their dealings with non-Muslims. Classic, I mean, Al-Qaeda itself. You may have noticed that Al-Qaeda, different people calling themselves Al-Qaeda, offshoots of Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda copycats, have killed people all over the world. In the Philippines, in England, and so on. The only place they've never attacked is in Israel. I wonder why. I wonder why they've never attacked Israel. Just one of those things, you know. Just as the Iranians example. So... We must accept the reality. We must not be frightened by it. I personally, in Israeli case, I, if soldiers rebel, the judge advocate will uh, charge them. They will put them to the kele, to the prison. My wife, who just left, was very appropriately the head of a military prison in Israel during a military service. I'm now her only prisoner. <laughs> but, and. Um, so far, in every single episode, when soldiers did this or that, they were very quickly tried. There were no street process. There were no mutinies. There were no revolts. They went to military prison and sat there. 
And I am therefore not nervous about this either. Okay. And now, in regard to Geula Cohen, who was, of course, an immensely secular person, who lived in an immens immensely secular way, she told you that the current generation of Jews have no right to give up this. I just point out to you that this is identical to the Hamas position, Absolutely. that the land is a waqf, is an, Israeli, an Islamic uh, foundation, an Islamic donation, and therefore nobody has the right to dispose of it. I will also tell you that if you do a considerable mixture of violence, bombing, action, physical, and so on, they will sign a deal. Got to adjourn. Any final comments? Yeah, very, very quick. First of all, I wish, you know, there were more religious people who are ready to work together toward understanding. It's, it could have been reached. I'm not sure it's on the table right now. Um, I think that the Holy Basin is, is a religious issue. Uh, the question is how we can distance ourselves, uh, in my view, from solving the religious issue and allowing the tree religion to uh, approach, pray, practice in this region without solving the sovereignty issue. Uh, though historically one should say there was no correlation between sovereignty and religiosity. Uh, the Wailing Wall was the holiest place for the Jews even when it wasn't under our sovereignty. Nevertheless, I think we should uh, con construct a new construction there. And the last thing about the soldiers, I'm worried because the parliament is not allowing the judicial courts to deal with the rebels the way they should be. And you should know that the parliament just passed uh, legislation, which I think is unprecedented. People didn't really notice it. That people who were trialed during uh, the evacuation of Gaza and uh, got uh, legal um, uh, it's not penalty, it's, it's sort of registered in their files, criminal, the, record. criminal records, sorry, thank you. Their record should be erased because they were fighting the right kind of uh, debate. And the soldiers who rebelled weren't penalized, weren't sent to uh, prison, they were notified that this so is not... Now with administratively, right. chapter and, 11. And, and that is, I think, uh, a huge mistake because it only shows how fearful the government is from really saying, you guys did it, we close this Yeshiva, we take you to prison, and you pay the price of your conviction, which is okay. I mean, people should pay the price of the conviction, but this, not is, this is not what is happening, and therefore, I'm more worried than you are. Okay, uh, final word, Shibley. Um, well, it just there was one question to me about the Palestinians, um, and uh, I think again, you know, there's it, it, it's really surprising to me the absence of clarity in differentiating. We have a question pertaining to um, territorial control, um, whether or not you had a Palest you know, the, the, regardless of the, the the notion of Palestinian nationalism, the West Bank, Gaza, and and the Golan Heights are designated as occupied territories from which Israel is obligated to withdraw. Mm -hmm. Just like regardless of the Arab narrative of whether Israel is legitimate or not, Israel is legitimate by virtue of the designation by the United Nations. So that's number one. Number two, uh, when you talk about Palestinians, if you're referring to the Palestinian Arabs who uh, uh, live in the Holy Land, separate from Palestinian nationalism, obviously they've been there for centuries. And if you want to do genetic testing uh, uh, and figure out uh, who anybody came from where, and I, I wouldn't be surprised, by the way, that many of them uh, may turn out to have been originally Jews who, who converted to, to, to Islam or, 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 uh, or Christianity. Uh, nonetheless, they have the right to be there, absolutely. And regardless of whether they have a nationalism or not, that is a separate. The third question is nationalism, which is really the one where you can raise a question about whether Palestinian nationalism existed or didn't exist 100 years ago, 200 years ago. Well, Jordanian nationalism didn't exist. Kuwaiti nationalism didn't exist. Qatari nationalism didn't exist. I can tell you about the modern, we have a modern international system uh, about sovereignty, nationalism, and state that really is a product in the Middle East, a product of the end of the Ottoman Empire after World War I. And if you're going to start challenging the legitimacy of every one, we're going to unpack, unpack the whole system. Uh, the, the oddity from an Israeli perspective is the rise of Palestinian nationalism actually it opens up a pragmatic solution. Because if you take it away, 
then you yeah. you're left with a right of return, which is a principle that the, you know Palestinians could could have been driven by for the first generation, and then you don't have a compromise. So so that is the peculiarity of it. Is that actually the rise of Palestinian nationalism is the reason why we have the possibility of a two-state solution, which remains the only one on the table. Well, thank you, Shibli, for, uh, and, and the speakers for your, for your remarks. Thank you for attending today's uh, uh, meeting, which has been a rich discussion co-organized by the Middle East Program of the Wilson Center and the Gildenhorn Institute of Israel Studies. We remain very grateful to uh, Professor Perry and colleagues and, of course, to Joseph and Alma Gildenhorn for uh, their support of this series. Uh, please join me in thanking our speakers for their excellent presentations today.